Greetings. I am Brother Jay Spence. Bokotov. Good morning. Blessed uprising on this blessed first day of this new week, this new cycle. As we say in the Hebrew, good week or Shavuot Tov. Blessed new week and blessed Sunday morning or so called Sunday morning of this new cycle. We shall continue what is now considered last week's Torah portion reading of Balak in the Haftarah continuation, which would be in the prophet Micah, beginning in chapter 5, verse 6, to chapter 6, verse 8. So get our Bibles, our Tanakhs ready, and let's get our minds right this morning meditation. It's a continuation from what is now considered last week's Torah portion reading, so we can get caught up with this new week. Yesterday on Shabbat was a blessed uh, memorial. It was a special Shabbat, or a special seven-day Sabbath. On your so-called Saturday, we had right here in, in my hometown of Roanoke, Virginia, we had uh, a memorial for my good friend Marion Weedle, uh, this young, uh, let's say a, a nice young woman. I like to call her a girl, you know. But she was a grown woman in the flesh, probably in her mid to latter 30s, way too young to die. And it still saddens my heart right now as I speak to um, think about Marion, think about the fact that less than a month ago she, she was still alive. And I had no clue. I thought she was alive and well. Had not talked to her in probably almost two years. Been a little over a year and a half, I think. My lady Pam and I bumped into her and her present boyfriend or some guy friend she was with which was all good and there was no there was no uh, friction or any tension between her and I she said hi what's up I said hey how's it going good to see you it was small talk you know, I told Pam my lady not to be jealous she is technically an ex-girlfriend but it was only for like I don't know it was only officially official for like two or three weeks and then I'm just going to say, out of love and respect for her, rest in peace, since I just went to her memorial service uh, yesterday on Shabbat to do good on the Sabbath, as Yeshua talks about, as Jesus Christ talks about, as our Lord and Savior, and as Messiah in the first Advent. He teaches us to do good on Shabbat. You know, there was nothing violating the Sabbath by simply walking into a worldly atmosphere granted it is a worldly atmosphere but to do good on shabbat or do good on the seven day sabbath to do good on the seven day sabbath you know we show love to people when they have memorial services excuse me when they have memorial services out of honor you know for their life it's kind of like a funeral service because i honestly heard nothing this past uh, two or three weeks about an actual um, funeral service. I heard she was cremated or maybe they kept the body. But what I did hear about and what we did hear about yesterday uh, afternoon on Sabbath at Awful Authors downtown, right, right there on Campbell Avenue in the heart of downtown Roanoke, right here in my hometown. Um, we had a little get together in the, uh, the back room. But they have the pool tables and the TVs and everything. And even Jason Martin, the big owner of uh, Martin's downtown and his wife and <clears throat> a lot of other mutual friends and, and family were there. You know, a few people I recognize and I chatted with. And it was good to have just at least a few people who gives a damn, for lack of better words, come out. And the, the brethren who... Stood up on the uh, pool table with his bare feet, took off his socks and shoes, gets up on the, one of the pool tables and stands up. And he's even quoting some verses from the Bible. And he was down to earth. He even talked about how Marion would say this and that. And, oh, God bless America. And when he would said that, it kind of brought back memories from this time three years ago when I had my little interaction with her. And we, we hung out and dated for a good month, almost a month and a half. We had some fun and I just wrote and signed this big poster board with all these different pictures of her and other friends and ex-boyfriends uh, besides me. I guess I'm not, I don't, not really sure if I count. We only dated for a quick 
two or three weeks before it had to be ended because on different paths. But it, it still breaks my heart that she's she's passed away. She's dead. This young woman that I connected with. And so even my present lady, Pam, my love, supported that. And I love her for that so much more. And just to realize that some people come into this world so broken. We are a little bit broken. We all have our baggages and things we've been through. You know, that brings back internal demons and activates more of the, uh, the evil inclinations within our minds and these, these bodies of flesh in this present life on earth. In connection with the spiritual darkness of this world and all this spiritual warfare and spiritual wickedness that takes place at the same time. You know, people are so broken sometimes through such trauma they've been exposed to in their childhood as innocent children even as innocent boys or little girls, to be so traumatized and violated, for lack of better words, but facts are facts, to be so broken to where when you grow up as an adult, whether it be a young man or a young woman, in your 20s, your 30s, 40s, 50s, so forth, you get my point, regardless of age, and you're carrying all this extra baggage, and we do things to self-medicate ourselves and we all do it to some degree which in moderation can be a good thing but if we're lacking that moderation it can uh, shorten our lifespans you know and it's sad that ones have to take certain extremities to self-medicate or silica self-medicate themselves because of these emotions and because of these unresolved matters that create internal demons and even attract actual spiritual demons through consumption of, of too much alcoholism, and too much drinking, too much usage of drugs and things to alter our minds, you know, to kind of kill the pain or numb the pain. And I get it because I drink on special occasions. I don't need to sit here and be a hypocrite on this video. I, I've done things in my past that are stupid. When I was a teenager, I, I just anything goes. I think I smoked crack once or twice when I was a teenager hanging out with my so-called friends from high school. You know, skipping, maybe skipping class or skipping school, smoking some shit that I, sh I should never have smoked, not even once in my whole life, but I did. You know, thank God, I thank Jah, I never got hooked. I've tried this, I've tried that. Just about everything, at least once or twice besides heroin, sticking needles into my arm, which I'm very thankful for that at this point now. As a man of Elohim, as a true born again son of Jah, I do not plan on sticking any needles into my arm, including so called vaccinations or heroin or whatever it might be. No vaccinations into this vessel because these bodies of flesh and blood are temples. We are divine temples in the lightness of the Most High, as above, so below. We should all be much more conscious about what we put into our physical bodies of flesh and blood. Even Christ Himself, or even Yeshua, the Messiah Himself. And the first advent, as I and I, Lord and Savior, and advocate to our Heavenly Father and our Elohim, even Christ himself says, the body is the temple. He says, my body is the temple. And it shall be broken down and destroyed. And on the third day, resurrected. And these, these, these Pharisees and these hypocrites, these so-called religious hypocrites, are hearing the words of Jesus Christ, or hearing the words of Yeshua himself, as the true Messiah in that first advent, thinking he's out of his mind. Like, this man can't be a, a, a Messiah. He can't even be a prophet. He's talking about, he's talking a bunch of crazy uh, blasphemy. He's talking a bunch of crazy stuff about he's going to you know, rebuild the temple in three days. It's taken us, it's taken us years, you know, months and years to even build this temple. You, you can't resurrect this temple in three days. And how dare you talk about the temple being destroyed? Although we know the temple was destroyed, that physical temple was destroyed in 70 AD. You know, after that final hedge of protection of the Most High was lifted up amongst the leftover survivors and the people within uh, Israel, such as the Yahudim, some of the Levites and, and Benjamites of the southern kingdom that were left, according to lineage, some of the sojourners who were faithful Israelites and faithful Yahudim that recognized Yeshua. They recognize Yahushua, or Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, 
as the one true prophet of all prophets in that time, and as Mashiach, that suffering servant, to be that, that final sacrificial lamb. They went back to their Torahs and the same Hebrew scriptures within Tanakh. And they looked and they compared and saw this, this Yeshua. He is the Messiah. He is the sacrificial lamb. Or that Passover lamb. The third day, people say they went into his tomb and they cannot find his body. He has been resurrected. Hallelujah. Raise Jah, the ones that were faithful and recognized that basic good news gospel with that uh, Brihad Shah, as we should properly say in the Hebrew, the Brihad Shah renewed covenant was manifested through Yeshua or through Jesus Christ. They recognized that Yahushua or Yeshua of Nazareth, the biological son of the carpenter, Yosef, another faithful um, Yehudi or faithful Israelite of flesh and of heart and his beloved uh, biological mother, Miriam, Mariam, that we call Mother Mary today with these whitewashed, blasphemous, Romanized images. Of, anyways, so yeah, we did good on Shabbat and Yeshua himself, or Jesus Christ himself, in the first Advent as Messiah and as our Lord and Savior, that we accept as Lord and Savior to be born again in, in connection, to be that final advocate to our Heavenly Father. That is our atonement and our covering in these renewed covenant times. No one comes to the Father to Hashem, the Father, except through the Son in these renewed covenant times. So, first and foremost, yeah, we do have to repent, not just confess, repent through a full metanoia, as we say in the Greek, but more properly in the Hebrew tongue, we say teshuva, a full teshuva or repentance, which is not only a cosmic shift to the heart and mind, but it means to turn around, turn away from sin. Because the trends, you know, the original definition of sin, according to the Bible, is transgression of the Torah, or transgression of the law. So, let us go back to the prophet Micah, and let's, let's get our hearts and our minds right for this meditation. Thanks. Yes, last year. Yeah. Prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 6. And they shall be shepherd, and, and they shall all shepherd the land of Ashur with the sword, and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from Ashur when he comes into our land, and when he treads within our borders. Wow. This verse 6 just hits us right there with, Verse 6, and they shall shepherd the land of Ashur. Who is they? That's the connection with Ashur, the land of Nimrod, with the Asherim, the Asherim poles, and that connection with the modern day commercial Christmas trees within today's world system. Right here in the core of daughter Babylon and parts of Europe and all over the world, we have our so called commercial Christmas trees around so called Christmas time during the cold season, right? Right now, we're not even thinking about that because it's towards the end of the so-called month of June, rigorously speaking. But still, we're in the months leading up to, uh, which will be in about three months from now, will be the uh, seventh month, Hebraically. The month of Tishrei, or seventh month, you know, Hebraically. But uh, it'll be the so-called ninth month, rigorously speaking, as well as Ethiopically, when we connect those deeper Afro-Semitic roots. So we'll, we'll have the Ethiopian New Year. And we'll have, uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah as well as the Feast of Trumpets leading into the Fall Feast of, of Jah's Feast or the Mohadim. <clears throat> right now, we're not even thinking about so-called commercial Christmas trees and Nimrod sticks. But right now, it speaks of in the prophet Micah. It says, and they shall shepherd the land of Ashur with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from Ashur. So that's a bondage, kind of a spiritual bondage, you know, a Mitzrayim type of captivity or oppression or downpression of these other deities. So you had the the the, the, the Salika, you had the deities of the false gods of ancient Egypt or Mitzrayim, not the earlier, you know, land of Egypt 
uh, going back to ancient Kemet, not that original dynasty of ancient Egypt, uh, which was more of a Yahweh or a Jehovah-based faith. We see the symbolism of the ram's horn. It's not just a, a Hebrew Israelite custom, but even going back to ancient Kemet, that symbolism of the ram of Elohim, the ram of God, the lamb of, of Elohim, and that connection with Christos or Messiah in the first advent, even the second advent as the one true king of kings. So we see that we see this uh, we see this prophetical alignment, you know, going back to ancient Kemet. So when I speak of Mitzrayim or Egypt, I speak of bondage. You know, Ashur Nimrai goes back to the ancient land of Babel. Goes back to Assyria and these ancient original Babylonian empires of Hasatan or Satan and the fallen ones dealing with idol worship. I think that the land of Babel or the first century Babylonia was in parts of the Middle East, say parts of Iraq. Some would say parts of Syria. Um, but anyways, screen just popped up. But anyways, let us be mindful of these things because it's easy to really dumb things down. It's easy to, you know, real easy to dumb things down and just kind of go with the mindset or the world system way of thinking and just kind of jump on the bandwagon. Just kind of we're bombarded with commercialism. 24 seven, just like it's kind of easy to buy into the uh, mumbo jumbo propaganda of he say, she say, let's, let's be first to line up and get our vaccinations kind of vibe around so-called Christmas, you know, or commercial Christmas. They bombard us with images of Asherim, cause for cause. So a picture of the Asherim Christmas tree, you know, so we can dumb it down and say, well, for a lot of people, it's just tradition. It's just a Christmas tree, brings back nostalgia, seems to be innocent. It's a uh, it's sun wreath image of jealousy, going back to ancient Babel, ancient Babylon, and even, even uh, ancient Rome. It's kind of an offshoot of, of Babylonia, just like uh, these other Great oppressive empires such as uh, Persia, Greek, you know, we have Greece, and then we have Rome. You know, all offshoots of ancient Babylonia. And that uh, prophetical image revealed to the prophet Daniel or Daniel interpreting the, the um, vision of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The so-called king of, of Babylonia in that time, in that captivity. Such as uh, the great prophet Daniel or Daniel. And Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, these faithful Yahudim, faithful Israelites of heart, that would not bow down to that statue. So it's not much for us to ask. We don't have that much pressure right now in these last of last days. Just be wise. Don't take the vaccine. If you don't feel like, if you feel uneasy about it, don't be so quick to just, you know, if you do end up taking it for personal reasons, because of health reasons, or because of one might be elder, they might be elderly and old and sickly, he's suffering from disease or, or certain health issues. That's one thing. Even then I would pray and meditate about these things. Don't be so quick to jump on the bandwagon and think, okay, it's so-called, you know, commercial Christmas time. You know, you can, you can tap into that Christmas spirit, put up a few Christmas lights and, you know, there's some Christmas music that is good. That's more price based about the physical birth of Yeshua or Jesus Christ. Those are good the good side of Christmas, but then the commercialism of Satan Claus or Santa Claus and these these trees do not symbol, they're not really meant to symbol Christ as the tree of life, as the tree of knowledge of knowing good and evil, the tree of knowledge of knowing good and evil that you partook, which you were supposed to not partake, you know, mentally, spiritually speaking, or, you know, philosophically, <laughs> I think I just made that word up, but, uh, more, it's more of a philosophy or more of a, uh, what's the actual word I'm trying to say here? Metaphysically speaking, metaphysically speaking, or metaphorically speaking, when we take upon the tree of knowledge of knowing good and evil, we're being disobedient to Jah's commandments. 
for being disobedient to Hashem's commandments on this earth. So it's one thing if you don't know better, of course, a lot of good-hearted Christians, even our families, our grandparents and nephews and nieces and cousins, a lot of them still in 2021 in this age of information know not what they do. Or maybe it's just too much of a it is too much of a peer pressure thing because we see it everywhere in our faces, everywhere you go, every place of business, every commercial on TV, every movie, every so-called you know Christmas movie that comes out, you have the Christmas tree. So we feel we need a Christmas tree for our, our houses. And I'm saying you don't. That's where you can put your foot down. That's where a lot of us who wake up to the truth should put our foot down because, okay, I know it's not that you're worshiping intentionally and bowing down to a so-called Christmas tree. Whether it's an actual tree cut from the forest and decked out with uh, silver, as it speaks of in Jeremiah chapter 10, or whether, it, whether it's a plastic um, artificial Christmas tree or an artificial commercial uh, commercial Christmas tree you put up and you deck it out with lights and little ornaments and it looks cute and pretty. And I get that. It brings back the nostalgia from when you were a child and you had those butterflies in your stomach thinking about uh, Santa Claus coming down the chimney to eat milk and cookies and drop off gifts and give you presents and things you ask for as an innocent little boy or an innocent little girl. You get those butterflies in your stomach when you see little children opening gifts. And, you know, I get it. We get all that 100%. There is a good side to the commercial Christmas spirit. But not to get too much into that. We'll have, we'll put out some um, video lectures in the near future as it gets closer to the season, many months from now. But right now, it's just the point of, yeah, you, you can you can say Merry Christmas. You can even go to your mother's house or grandma's house, your, your friend's house every once in a while. And if you can help not going on so-called Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, it's better. But if you have to, because we have friends and family, I know it's not all that black and white. Just go, say Merry Christmas, receive some gifts, you know, give some gifts. If, if you know, Because usually it's around the time of Hanukkah, that, that Hanukkah spirit or that Hanukkah spirit which is a genuine holiday that we should celebrate. It's not one of the Mohadim. It's not, a, it's not an appointed feast day, but it's something we should celebrate. The victory of, of, of Yahweh's victory over Antiochus and, and that, that tyranny that took place in, in Jerusalem in that time. The, the victory over their enemies and taking back Jerusalem is a good thing to celebrate. You know, even Christ, Yeshua, was going down to uh, parts of Jerusalem or Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication. As I and I say the, the Feast of Dedication. So yeah, Hanukkah is a great holiday to celebrate. Not from so much a Eurocentric Jewish perception. All due respect to them as well. You celebrate for good reasons. Okay. But we know the true ethnic Yahudim, Falasha, Ethiopian, Hebrew. That the Falasha, Ethiopian, Hebrew, Israelite connection. According to lineage of the ethnic tribe of Judah. In that time, you know. But we know that through Jah's kingdom, we are all called from, from all nations. Through, through Hashem's kingdom, we are called from the far ends of the earth of different nations, even of those Gentiles like myself, even those of I and I Gentiles grafted in through Jah's grace, through the King of Kings and Yahshua HaMashiach, to be a part of that spiritual, um, more hardical connection of Jah's kingdom and the body of Christ, which is connected with Israel. So we are a spiritual Israel. We're talking about the ethnic seed people that were persecuted in that time and that tyranny. So yeah, we should celebrate Hanukkah. It's usually around the close, close to the same time as, as commercial Christmas. We can tap into that Christmas spirit and look at look at the uh, true Christ-like or true Messiah-like example that Haile Selassie, His Majesty, the King of Kings, set that set that example for us of how to relate to the Gentile nations and other Christians. You know. Ali Selassie even said Merry Christmas to a lot of the um, good-hearted Christians in America, you know, but he knew the true Christmas celebration was January 7th. We speak of, Gregorically speaking, January 7th is the true Ethiopian Christmas, the celebration of the first sighting of the Christ child. It has nothing to do with Nimrod sticks and commercial Christmas trees and Saint Nicholas, although even His Majesty did entertain a lot of European Gentile Christians just coming out of dispensationalism back in you know, the, um, the earlier century, back in the 60s, um, early 70s before his uh, betrayal 
before they betrayed his imperial majesty in 1974, 1975. So, with all that being said, you know, we have, a, we have an example through spiritual Tai Chi. Go to your mama's house or go to your friend's house and say Merry Christmas. But as far as putting up, you know, even, even deck the halls with some Christmas lights and nativity scene, if you choose to. But avoid putting up that Christmas tree. Because your so-called Christmas tree, although it may be dumbed down by the world system, on movies and commercials and things we see on TV, is just an innocent decoration as far as traditions of man. A lot of false Christians and false witnesses will tell you, like, oh, that's just symbolized the tree of life. No, you should not even put that up because it attracts evil spirits into your home. Even if you're prayed up as a good-hearted Christian. The Satan Claus, come on. Santa, Satan, Satan Claus. How come that has become the commercialized focus of Christmas? And then people say, they say in uh, the next breath, well, it's all about the birth of Jesus, or the birth of Jesus Christ. But then they don't even talk about Jesus Christ. They ask these little Innocent boys and girls, what, what Santa's going to bring them for Christmas? Or what Santa got them for Christmas? You know, you see this satanic influence. So yeah, cut out the Satan claws, cut out the, the Asherim, so-called Christmas trees. Take them down, burn them, or just put them in the trash. You don't have to burn them and set them on fire and, and smash them into pieces. Although the Torah of life, the Bible does encourage us to do so. But just, just trash them, throw them out, and... Stop putting up Christmas trees in your home on so-called Christmas Day or so the so-called month of December. Those things are like nimrod sticks. They're like rods that attract demonic spirits. Trust me. When you begin to open up and try to keep the commandments, those two different worlds, those two different worlds clash. When you open up your heart to Torah, the foundation of Jah's commandments and that fulfill Christ's spirit, you begin to see a pool. Like you can't you can't serve the most high. And drink from the cup of demons anymore. You're called to be more true Christians and fulfilled Israelites in, in Messiah. Even so, through his, his majesty as the king of kings in Yeshua. Because his majesty may have entertained the European uh, Christians and Gentile Christians around that time outside of his palace. But inside of his palace walls in Addis Ababa, in the monarchy of David, there was no Nimrod stick worship, no Satan clause, none of that. It was in the true Ethiopian Christmas Around that same time, with that universal Christmas spirit, we acknowledge the birth of, or the first sighting. Not so much the physical birth, but the first sighting of the Christ child. Jesus Christos, or baby Yeshua, and that first Advent as Messiah. So anyways, it says, They shall shepherd the land of Ashur with the sword, and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. And he shall deliver us from Ashur, when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. And the remnant of Yaakov shall be in the midst of many peoples. Verse 7. The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples as dew from Hashem, or dew from the name Yahweh, as showers on the grass, which do not wait for man nor delay for the sons of men. There shall be a remnant of Jacob with that physical seed of ethnic Ethiopian you know, Hebrews and African Israelites, according to the flesh and blood. And then those of Ionai, righteous Gentiles, as a, as a part of that remnant as well. So there shall be a remnant of Yaakov that shall be in the midst of many peoples, as dew from Hashem, that residue from the Lord, Yahweh, as showers on the grass, which do not wait for man, nor delay for the sons of men. They don't wait for the sons of men who are not born again, who are not faithful, to keep Jah's commandments. To hold the true testimony of, of Yeshua or Jesus Christ. Verse 8 And the remnant of Yaakov shall be amongst the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of a forest, like a young lion amongst flocks of sheep, who, if he passes through, shall both tread down and shall tear, and there is no one to deliver. So it says, The remnant of, of Jacob or Israel shall be amongst the nations. In the midst of many peoples, like a lion amongst the beasts of a forest, like a young lion amongst the flocks of sheep, who if he passes through, shall both tread down and shall tear, and there is no one to deliver. So there is no, no one to save the enemies, or save the adversaries of the Most High. And those of our enemies, there is no one to deliver them from Yah's wrath and judgment.
when it comes to Hashem's wrath. It says, verse 9, Let your hand be lifted up against your adversaries, and all your enemies be cut off. That all your enemies, both in spirit and in flesh, at this point, cut off. There's been enough grace and mercy for years and years. This is the final judgment. It says, your enemies will be cut off, and it shall be in that day, declares Hashem, that I shall cut off your horses out of your midst, and I shall destroy your chariots, and I shall cut off the cities of your land, and I shall pull down all your strongholds, and I shall cut off witchcrafts out of your hand, and let you have no magicians, and I shall cut off your carved images and your pillars from your midst, so that you no longer bow down to the work of your hands. He's even bringing judgment upon his own careless Israelites, not the faithful true Israelites, but the faithful people of, of his chosen ones, which is the remnant of Yaakov, that remnant of Jacob, which in renewed covenant times is the body of Messiah. Those who keep the commandments of Hashem, those who keep the Torah and the, and the true testimony of Messiah. And it says, I shall cut off the cities of your land and pull down all your strongholds. And I shall cut off witchcrafts and sorceries out of your hand and let you have no magicians. I'm not supposed to be dealing with sorcery and witchcraft. That's satanic. I mean, that's dealing with idol worship outside of Hashem. And I shall pluck your Asherim out of your midst in verse 14. I shall pluck your Asherim out of your midst and shall destroy your cities. And I shall take vengeance and wrath and rage on the nations who did not obey. So we see that happening now. I mean, we see that happening right now in these last of last days. Of Jah's rightful judgment in the earth. Of Hashem's you know, tough love. And we see still the beauty of his grace, his mercy, his love and salvation that's still reaching out. In this sifting process, in these last of last days, from the far ends of the earth, we see more people, those of I and I, wake up mentally, spiritually, to open our eyes, you know, and see in Kabbalah, receive that truth of His Holy Spirit, the fullness of His true Holy Spirit, or that true Ruach Kakodesh, in the name of Yeshua, you know, Bahasham Yeshua, in these renewed covenant times, even through His Majesty, as the one true King of Kings, in Jesus Christos, or in the name of in the true divine name of Yahushua, meaning Yahweh salvation or Jehovah is salvation. Um, all these different names, Yahweh, Yahovah, or Jehovah, simply means Jah salvation or God is salvation through Joshua or through Jesus. That's what Jesus means. You know, pronounced Jesus, Jesus Christ. You know the. Uh, Romanizers, you know, the, the Roman Catholics and the Protestants like to say, you know, Jesus. They put that Jesus emphasis, you know, Jesus, Jesus, but his proper interpretation is Jesus Christ or, you know, Jesus Christos. And that leads back to his original Hebrew name, Yeshua. You know, and he taught us to keep the commandments according to the pure teachings of Christ himself. Not Antichrist Jesus, but the true Christ Jesus, Yeshua, teaches us to keep the, the Torah and keep the commandments within this Bible. Pure, authentic understanding and proper interpretation of this Bible from Genesis to Revelation and so forth. That's why many are called but few are chosen. It says, I shall pluck your Asherim out of your midst and shall destroy your cities and I shall take vengeance and wrath and rage on the nations who did not obey. See, in this age of information, even we studied the further teachings of His Majesty, Ali Selassie I, of course, he says, for my part, I glory in the Bible. So that's foundational, first and foremost, to meditate in Jah Torah, in this great book of life, day and night, as we all should. However, his majesty also teaches, in this age of information, ignorance is only a choice. You know, so we see this wrath and judgment through school shootings, <clears throat> even in, in these past five or six years. Where is that spiritual hedge of protection over, over these so-called Christian churches? People getting shot up in the churches. These so-called uh, Jewish synagogues, these so-called Islamic mosques in parts of New Zealand and other other parts of Babylon, not just not just the core of daughter Babylon, America or Europe. We see parts of, you know, New Zealand. There was a the shooting in a mosque uh, in the past couple years. Terrible thing. And of course, we, we pray for the, the victims and it's a terrible thing. We tear our garments and we mourn and we, we shed tears and pray for these people and their families. But at the same time. 
Yah's wrath, you know, the wrath and judgment of the Most High is, is manifested to make it more than obvious for all of us. We have all these plagues of Babylon, such as natural disasters, um, these wildfires, these, these droughts, these floods in the south, and tornadoes and earthquakes, volcanoes erupting all over the earth right now. <clears throat> That's judgment. These nations need to repent. And even the majority of so-called Christians caught up in dispensation theology and that, that, that type of spiritual Mitzrayim or, or that, that spiritual Egypt, which is that mental psychological bondage and even that spiritual bondage preventing you from excelling as a true Christian, as a true fellow born again Christian or Christ man or Christ woman in the earth and that true core body of Messiah, according to what the Bible says, you won't repent and take down your so-called commercial Christmas tree. And I'm not trying to be over legalistic about it. I'm just speaking the truth. A basic prophet or a saint is simply somebody who speaks the truth. Not always calls out or is able to see the future. You know, the high degree, high level prophets, you know, were able to see the future. But at the same time, there is nothing new under the sun. So a lot of what we think is the future is just repetitive cycles of history throughout space and time in this present time. Chapter 6. Hear now what Hashem is saying. Arise, strive with the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Verse 2. Hear, O you mountains, the controversy of Hashem, the controversy of the name Yahweh Jah, and you, everlasting foundations of the earth. For Hashem has a controversy with his people, and he shall reprove Israel. My people, what have I done to you, and how have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Mitzrayim, you know, from that land of uh, Egypt or bondage. And I ransomed you, says Jah. I ransomed you from the house of bondage. And I sent Moshe or Moses, Aaron and Miriam before you. Right there we have a triunity prophetical picture of Moshe or, or the prophet Moses, Aaron and, and Miriam before you. <laughs> My people remember, please. What Balak, sovereign of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, from Shatim to Gilgal, in order to know the righteousness of Hashem, the righteousness of the Lord, Yahweh. Verse 6. With what shall I come before Hashem, bow myself before the high Elohim? Shall I come before him with ascending offerings, with calves a year old? Verse 7. Is Hashem pleased? Is the Lord Yahweh pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my being? Verse 8. Has he declared to you, O man, what is good? And what does Hashem require of you? But to do right and to love loving commitments and to walk humbly with your Elohim. What is the Most High, our Heavenly Father, as our wonderful Creator? And our Elohim, what does he want from us? What, what does he expect from us but to simply strive to love him and walk in his ways? It's not much to ask. It says, what does Hashem require of you but to do righteousness? You know, to do right and to love loving commitments and to walk humbly with your Elohim, with your God, and your Savior, in the name of Yeshua, or in the name of Jesus Christ. Not much to ask. And we see that connection with the actual Torah portion. Uh, we finished up uh, the previous vid, so-called Friday night on uh, the eve of Shabbat. Once again, yesterday was a busy, very busy day for me and my lady to show to show our faces at the memorial for uh, Marion Weedle, uh, my good friend Marion Weedle. Rest in peace, rest in shalom. Will always be loved and missed. And then we had to go to her parents' house and help out her parents in their situation. And then we got, got together with Matt. And it was just a day of celebrating and drinking. Of course, I have not drank in the past week. I don't drink that much. And for many people, it's good not to drink at all. You know, but right now, I'm drinking my coffee. But we see that, that connection with the actual tour portion. And that connection with Balaam and son of Beor. And that connection with Balak the king of Moab, who tried to get another potential prophet type 
that same prophet type in connection with the same Elohim who was, a, who was an outsider. He wasn't really joined up with Israel, but he was a different type of prophet or a potential prophet that just connected with, with Elohim. He was able to speak with Elohim through the, through the Ruach HaKodesh. Says the Lord Yahweh was able to speak to Balaam and told him, look, you have somewhat of a spiritual connection with me through your daily meditations and prayers and supplications. Like, but since you can hear my voice, I tell you, these are my people, Israel. Do not curse them. You shall bless them and not curse them, period. And, and, and things are just point blank, right and exact, more than obvious for, for us to see and to read about in this Bible, in this great book of life. And it says very clearly in the scriptures when we get into the basic Judaic and Hebraic roots of, of the scriptures, you know, in, in the true Christ mind, as true born again sons of, of the Most High. And two, two born again sons and daughters, ladies, I'm not leaving out to you ladies and you wonderful sisters out there, but as brethren and sisters of Jah's kingdom, you know, we, we are to see these things. And when Jah makes it very clear through the basic roots of his of his scripture, through that Iret, you know, through that Ruach HaKodesh, through that woman uh, Kadus that abides within us, then we can't just decide to, like, well, I know God said that. I know the Most High Jah or Yahuwah of Israel said, do not put up an Asherah pole, or do not put up a so-called commercial Christmas tree. And some will argue, well, it doesn't say that, Brother Spence. You're saying Asherim. That's not really the truth. And then you look it up in this age, of, this age of information. In this same age of information, which even Hali Selassie, the further teachings of his majesty, uh, majesty Selika, the further teachings of his majesty, Karamawi Hali Selassie, I, says, in this age of information, ignorance is only a choice. So, of course, we have access to the Bible. We have access to Jah Word, to this great book of life, to this fulfilled tour of life from Genesis to Revelation and so forth. We have access to the super information highway through our laptops, through our, our cell phones. Ignorance is only a choice. You can look up Asherim and make um, precepts through secular information as well, and secular history to find out how to connect the dots. If the Most High, Yahweh, as our Heavenly Father, and our Elohim tells us, do not do this. If he tells us, through his main ten commandments, rest on the seven-day Sabbath, rest on the true seven-day Shabbat, do not do any work on that day, you shall rest and keep it holy, spend more time in meditation and study and fellowship and, and prayer, keep it set apart. Six days you shall work, but see, in the carnal mind, well, I know God said that, but I feel like I could probably just get by. I, I can probably get by with doing this anyway. You know, I can go out and spend money and do some work on the Sabbath. You know, it's just another day of the week. Does God really care what day it is? I hear a lot of so-called Christians that I still love in the spirit of Christ. But I hear a lot of so-called Christians make excuses, excuses, excuses. But what more does our Elohim and our true Heavenly Father, a God of love and salvation, expect from us? What does he really ask from us? It says... It says, he has declared to you, O oh man, what is good? And what does Hashem require of you but to do right, but to love, loving commitment, and to simply walk humbly with your Elohim, you know, with your God, to love and keep his commandments, to hold the true testimony of Yeshua or Jesus Christ, Revelation 12 and 17, Revelation 14 and 12. John, or you know, the gospel according to Johanna, 14 and 15. If you love me, says Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua himself. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, Matthew, or Matthew Tiahu, 5 and 17. I come not to abolish Torah, but fulfill. Those who keep the commandments and teach others the same are great in Jah kingdom. That is all. I'm going to finish this cup of joe. I may have time for that gospel, uh, that final gospel completion of what is, what is now. 11.35 a.m. Sunday morning, what is now considered last week's Torah portion reading. So, I'm also blessed to have, uh, might I say, I'm blessed to have this day off. Because usually on your so-called Sunday mornings, you know, i got to go into work. I've been working six days a week for the past almost two years now. Like a whole year and ten months. 
So it's nice to have every other weekend off. And I was supposed to have last Sunday off, but that's a whole different anyway. Let's get things some grace. Love you all. Stay tuned for the uh, gospel completion. If I get that done sometime today or sometime this week, hopefully. Hopefully as soon as possible. I'm kind of in the middle of job searching right now and going to job interviews and things of that sort. So bear with me. Shalom.